Shalom, everybody, and welcome to Advanced Hebrew. So this is the class that will follow Intermediate Hebrew. So I uh, recommend uh, going through Intermediate Hebrew first before taking this one. And if you don't know the alphabet, uh, beginning Hebrew before taking that. All of those past classes you can find on YouTube at the Passion for Truth video channel. So go there and check those out if you haven't, uh, haven't already. Um, <clears throat> the classes for Advanced are not yet posted on YouTube because I'm starting them today. So uh, if I had a time machine, I'd go ahead and go forward in time and post those now. Um, but that would probably create some kind of a paradox, so I won't do that. Anyway, on, back on to Hebrew. The notes for this class you can find at theregathering.com slash page slash PFT Hebrew 3. Okay, beginning is 1, intermediate is 2, advanced is 3. So we are on week one of Advanced Hebrew. Um, don't let the term Advanced Hebrew scare you. It's really just an extension of Intermediate Hebrew. But by the time we're through with this class, our next phase after Advanced Hebrew will be laying the groundwork to be able to actually interpret a few scriptures. So that is my goal for the next class is to start digging into some things and parsing out some verses. So you won't know every single thing you need to know to translate the entire Bible um, because I don't know all of those things either. So it's hard, kind of hard for me to teach them, but um, especially in the time, the time that I have. But uh, we'll be able to go through some basic things and, uh, and uh, you'll be able to actually read a few verses. And uh, the continuing study from there will be what expands your field of uh, interpretation. So, but anyway, we're still laying the groundwork, so here we go. All right, in Intermediate Hebrew, we talked about nouns, adjectives, prepositions, and pronouns, and we talked just a little bit about verbs. <clears throat> and in advanced, we're going to focus in a lot closer on verbs. They're really a subject all their own, um, and we're not going to cover them exhaustively, but we're gonna at least get some of the basics down so that you uh, have a good um, overview of how verbs function. <clears throat> okay, verbs are really the core of the Hebrew language. Um, Hebrew is said to be a very uh, concrete language, a very active language, a language of doing. And uh, that's very much true because the, the verb is the most prevalent, um, prevalent part of speech in Hebrew by far. And verbs in Hebrew serve many functions. Uh, the Hebrew word for verb is poal. And... Um, for some reason, I have a bad feeling that I misspelled this in the notes. Um, I did, in fact, misspell that in the notes. Poal is spelled pe vav ayin lamed. Okay, not aleph, it is an ayin. So correct that in your notes. I will correct that on mine as well. Uh, that was a sleep deprived error on my part. <clears throat> but yes, poal, and it's very important uh, that you spell this right because that. Uh, it's very key later on. <clears throat> but anyway, poal is the Hebrew word for verb. And a poal is a doer. Okay? So a noun is shame etzim, which means name of essence. An adjective is toar, which means a describer. Poal is a doer. And in fact, you know, a verb is referred to as an action word. It's a word that describes an action. In a dictionary, or on uh, our vocabulary lists, poal is abbreviated as just a, a small pe. So if you see a word in a dictionary or a vocabulary list with a small pe on it, it means that that word is in fact a verb. Um, most verbs in Hebrew, I would say all, but there are a couple of uh, exceptions, most verbs in Hebrew are reducible to three-letter root words. 
All right, not so much that they are reducible to that as they are derived from three-letter root words. So this word poal that I just described, okay, poal is a noun that means a verb, okay, but it derives from a three-letter root, pe, i, and lamed, okay, no vowels, okay, the roots have no particular vowels attached to them, they're just three letters. <clears throat> and the base meaning of this root is to act or to do. Okay. And from this, we can construct verbs that mean all sorts of variations of to act or to do. Now, what do I mean by variations? Well, a verb can have a tense, it can be past tense, it can be future tense. There are also a number of other kinds of tenses. Um, a verb can be active or it can be passive. A verb can be singular or it can be plural. It can be masculine or feminine. It can be said in the first person, the second person, or the third person. Um, there are lots of different ways to uh, subtly change the meaning of a verb, but when you go back to the root, it has the same the same root for for related verbs. So, um, for example, take the root kaf tav bet, and I have this listed in your vocabulary list as well. Kaf tav bet as a root means to write. And that's what I was going to mention too, is that uh, when you see a verb in a dictionary or a vocabulary list, it will always be written as its root. Okay, you will not find a verb in a dictionary that's third person, future tense, feminine, you know, you won't find every possibility. The dictionaries would be this thick if you did. Um, and uh, it's also worth noting that if you uh, look up things in a Strong's Concordance, this is also how uh, verb roots are listed. Verbs are listed by their root, not by the full word. I mentioned this with uh, nouns and the strongs as well. Nouns you'll find just as the base noun. You won't find a noun with prefixes or suffixes added to it because, again, if you did every possible iteration, the strongs concordance would be this thick and would not be very convenient, actually, at that point. So, yes, verbs are listed by their root. Okay, so, cough, Tav, bait is a root that means to write. Tav means to write? <clears throat> yeah, just the, the root itself. Now, uh, several possible iterations of this, and we're going to, as we move along, we'll see why these are the iterations that they are. If we take this root and we add some vowels to it, okay, so comments here in a patach here making katav, okay. If we, yes, yes, katav, okay, this has the same base meaning to write, okay, but this word is, and get ready for this long list, it is in the third person, it is masculine, it is singular, and it is in the past tense. Okay? So, what this verb means, what katav means, is third person masculine equates to he. Okay? It's the third person and it's masculine, so it's he and not she. Oh, yeah, third person masculine singular, I should say, equates to he. Uh, yes, right. Me, first person. Yeah, I, I is first person, you, second person, he is third person. Okay? All right, and past tense of write is wrote. Okay, so katav means he wrote. Okay? So if you just saw the word katav on its own, this is how it would be translated. Now, frequently in translation, you won't translate the he because the he is replaced by the subject of the sentence. This third person masculine singular tells you 
what the subject that's attached to this verb has to be. You can only use katav if the subject is in the third person, masculine, and singular. So, if we were to speak of a man, Adam, okay, we're speaking of Adam, not to Adam, so it's third person, and we wish to say Adam wrote, okay, Adam katav. And of course, because word order is not is uh, flexible, we could also say katav adam. Okay, all of those would mean Adam wrote. Okay, and I'm going to go through the entire past tense at some point, but I just want to show that this is this is how verb conjugation functions. You have to match the gender, the number. Uh, of the verb to the subject, and then it, and then you have to use the correct person if you're speaking of yourself to somebody or of somebody else, and you have to use the correct tense. Okay, this is past tense. Adam wrote. All right. We could also use the future tense. Okay. Before you go, you're going to use the feminine part of that third person. We will get to that in another week. I just want to illustrate that, that these differences exist right now. And yes, we will go through them in more detail. All right. But just to show you, if I, were to, if I was to say Adam will write, okay, so I'm just changing the tense, all right, because Adam remains the same, okay, he's still third person, masculine, and singular, but I'm just changing the tense. I'm going from past tense to future tense. So from Adam wrote to Adam will write, okay. The way that's done is like this. Okay, Adam Yechtov. Okay, now you don't need to memorize this just yet. I'm just using it for illustration. You notice that this has the same root, Kaf, Tav, Beit. We've added a Yod to the beginning though. And that's one of our indicators, that's one of the features of conjugation, is that vowels and letters can be added to the root in order to convey the specific meaning we want to get across. Okay? So the third person masculine singular future tense adds this adds this yod at the beginning. Okay? The Vav can be inserted. Uh, Yes, it, it's, yes, yeah, yeah. The, you'll see various letters that are added. Hays, Vavs, Yods, Nuns, um, Olives. Uh, right. Um, yes. So anyway, when we, get, when we get later on, we'll see entire conjugation charts. So it'll be separated by grids. You'll have masculine and feminine of the third person, second person, first person, singular and plural, future tense, past tense, so on and so forth. It's a giant grid. Okay, but the, the, the good thing is, though, if you take any root and you want to change it to whatever function you need, you just follow the rules on the grid. Yeah, yeah, and, and just, just fit it to your pattern because we can do the same thing with other roots. For, so, for example, um, let's say um, about, okay, malach, or just memlamid, kaf. Now we know this is melech, okay, the noun, which means a king. But as a verb, this means to rule. Okay, memlamid, kaf means to rule. All right, so if we wish to say that Adam ruled, we would follow the same pattern. Third person, masculine, singular, past tense. We would add the same vowels. Malach to mean he ruled. And so we can then say Adam Malach. Okay, Adam ruled. If Adam were, say, a king. So the root that we see in Strong's or any place or in the dictionary is. The verb. Yes. And it's the root form of that, whatever it is, 
with any more views than anything else. I think I'm getting this. Right. Yeah. Yeah, the verbs are all built off of these three-letter roots, okay? And, and yes, if we wish to make them, you know, if we wish to change the person, change the tense, change the gender, change the number, we'll add vowels and we'll add letters in certain places in order to do that. And there's a whole scheme of rules surrounding that. This is why verbs is saved for the advanced class, because there's a lot to it, a whole lot to it. And a lot of it's memorization, a lot of it's memorizing charts. Um, in my case, a lot of it is referring to charts that you've already written down instead of memorizing them. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, the, but just to, just to illustrate though, uh, just this one little point, if we wish to say Adam will rule, follows the same pattern. We've got the yod, okay, with the chirik, the shva under the first letter of the root, the cholam after the second letter of the root. Okay, yimloch, Adam will rule. Okay, yimloch. Okay, so using the same, not this, using two different roots, we just follow the same pattern. We add the same vowels and the same other letters to those roots. Okay, and it follows, and it uh, changes the person, the gender, the number, and the tense in the exact same way. Yes. Out of the Hebrew alphabet, can all of the alphabet be used as part of a root? Yes, yes. Any letter can be part of a root. Okay, and then, now this is where things get really complicated. Not now, but in a later class. Things get really complicated is the rules about how to change these can be affected by which Hebrew letters are used. So there are certain rules about it. if, say, the second letter of the root is a vav, you do things a little differently. If the first letter of the root is a nun, you do things a little differently. So there, gotcha. there's all these categories and subcategories, and it, get, it gets real, real complicated real fast. The, so it, it comes back to the base, and the base is a three-letter root. Right. And those three letters, wherever they are in the word, carry significance. Um, and where they are in a word. Yes, they will, they will affect how you will conjugate the verbs later. So, um, yeah, as far as, as far as affecting what the word means as a root, yeah, that's a whole other field of study, which is breaking down the... <laughs> but, but yes, as far as... The, the roots can be manipulated in very predictable ways to, to, to get the exact meaning that you wish. Okay. So anyway, just... Just just an introduction to the idea of conjugation, that you'll do the same thing, you'll apply the same pattern to different roots to yield, the res to, you know, to yield similar results, okay? So, he wrote, he ruled, okay? Yechtov, he will, he will write, yimloch, he will rule. You'll, you'll add the same combinations of letters and vowels to the root to get the same, same result. And yes, it'll change for feminine. So if I was to say that Rachel will rule, I would use a different word. You know, I'd use the same root, but I would have to shift this around so that it's a feminine noun instead of, or a feminine verb rather, instead of a masculine one. Okay, just like adjectives, you know, you have to, the verb has to accommodate the subject. Okay, so that's just an introduction to the idea of roots and of verb conjugation. Okay, and I am going to cover one specific kind of conjugation today, um, the easiest kind. <laughs> it's easy because it only has four iterations. The will wrote, so got yod with the Siri. Kof. Yes, Kof. With a shva. It's a, with a shva underneath it. Shva. Yeah. Okay. And then tov with the cholam. Yes, with a cholam, and then your last. Shva. Yeah, and when I write these in a pattern, you'll see like uh, the way I would write the pattern for the past tense form is I would write first letter of the root, second letter of the root third letter of the root, okay, 
and then I would put a comets here and a patach here. So then if you have a root, you just plug in first, second, third letters of the root into these positions, add the requisite vowels, and you've got your new word. So, and next to this, you know, you'll see that this is third person, masculine, singular, uh, past tense. It actually won't be, it won't be written next to it, it'll be in a grid form, so you can just kind of track everything down. But, um, now is that like a standard? Those placements there always end into the repeat MX? Well, yeah, now uh, one, thing in, one thing worth noting about the third person masculine singular past tense is um, in the Strong's Concordance, they list things by root, but they always write vowels with them. And this gets people thrown off a lot of times because they'll find those vowels there and they'll think that that's always how that word's pronounced. The vowels that they add in the Strong's Concordance to the root are the vowels for the third person masculine singular past tense. Okay. In the scriptures, you will find all sorts of combinations of vowels and letters, and that's because the verbs will be conjugated as necessary to fit the context, to fit the subjects that they're going along with. So, uh, or the, you know, if a verse is prophetic, it's not going to be written in the past tense. It's going to be written in the future tense. Okay, that's why the future tense exists, is to speak about things in the future. So, um, so anyway, yes, in, the, in, the, in a dictionary, they won't have vowels attached. But in a Strong's Concordance, they do attach these vowels. I'm not sure why. Maybe it's just so that, well, yeah, I'm not sure why, <laughs> but they do. But be it known that what they're getting at is the root. And for some reason, they attach the vowels that correspond to the third person, masculine, singular, past tense. Um, but that's not the only way that that verb will be conjugated. Not by a long, 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 long shot. So, but anyway, uh, so. Uh, the cholam was just by itself. The future, the future tense of the same thing. Okay. I thought it was, but I was looking at the chart down here. Right. Getting confused. Yeah, the future tense would be, okay, the third person masculine singular future tense. This is be the, the pattern for that. Okay. And again, in the future, we'll be covering the past tense and future tense and getting into, you know, all the different combinations, second person masculine singular, second person masculine plural, second person feminine plural, so on and so forth. Okay. But anyway, so yes, this one, two, three are the first, second, and third letters. We call them radicals. Okay, radical equals letter of the root. Okay, so first, second, and third radicals. You just plug in those root, root um, letters into this pattern and then you've got your transformation into the verb you want it to be. Okay. Okay. So the one we're actually going to be learning today is called, this is a verb conjugation into a form that is properly known as the active, now I say participle, but I've heard people say participle. I don't know where the emphasis actually goes because I am not an English professor. So please excuse me if I mispronounce this word. I know I'm spelling it right. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I've heard people say participle. I've always said participle. Okay. Well, I'll I'll take it as a two to uh, nothing majority then. I'm going to say partis er, participle, and just excuse me if I'm wrong. So, the active participle, um, this equates approximately to the present tense, okay? This, this uh, verb form can be used as the present tense. 
it's not technically the present tense, but it can function that way. So I'm not going to get into all the particulars, but I just want us to be able to actually use some of these verbs. Okay? So, when we're conjugating a verb into uh, the active part participle form, there are four, way, four possible ways that it can be transformed. So the masculine singular form, okay, uh, person doesn't matter in this. You can use the same form whether it's being used for the first person, the second person, or the third person. Okay, so person you can eliminate entirely. So you only need to worry about gender and number. And I don't know if you can see this real well on the camera because it's kind of small, but it is in the notes as well. So, but anyway. The masculine form looks like this, masculine singular form. So we've got our first radical followed by a vav with a cholam, second radical with a tzera, and then our third radical. So in the case of our root katav, which means to write, Our masculine, singular, active participle, or present tense, is kotev. And this equates to is writing. Okay? So if we wish to say that, again, our subject, Adam, We wish to say Adam is writing. Adam Kotev. Okay. Adam is writing. Okay. And again, we use this form because the subject is masculine and singular. And we can also use this, again, in, with the active uh, participle. It doesn't matter if it's first person, second person, or third person. So if I wish to say, I am writing, I can say, Ani Kotev. Or I can say, Atakotev, you are writing, if I were speaking to one man. Okay? So as long as the subject is masculine and singular, we can use our masculine singular active participle, which roughly equates to the present tense. Again, this is, I am writing. And you, again, ata is our masculine singular pronoun, are writing. Okay? So that's kotev. I did not leave myself enough room here, so I'm going to expand this a bit. Okay, how about the feminine singular? Feminine singular, first radical, vav with a cholam, second radical, with a segol now instead of a tzera. This line's getting in my way now. Never good at predicting how large I need to make these things. I think after several hundred I'd have the hang of it. But. All right, third radical, again with the segel, and now we put a tav at the end. O e e t. Okay. Yes. 
This is the feminine singular. So, for our new subject, Rachel, or in Hebrew, Rachel, for anyone named Rachel out there, that's your Hebrew name, Rachel, uh, which means a sheep, by the way. Which isn't a bad thing. Okay, Rachel, and again using our Katav, or probably no coincidence. Okay, using our root meaning to write. Got our Kaf, Vav with Cholam. Tav, Segol, Beit, Segol, and our Tav at the end. So Rachel Kotevet. Rachel Kotevet. And that would mean Rachel is writing. Okay? So if I were a woman, I would say Ani Kotevet, I am writing. And speaking to a woman, I would say at, again, the feminine singular second person pronoun, which means you, at, at kotevet, you are writing, okay? So that's masculine singular, kotev, feminine singular, kotevet, okay? The masculine plural, again, we've got our Vav Cholam in our second position. We've got a Shva under the second radical now. And now we add Im. Okay. So using our to write root, this would become Kot Vim. And we might say Haim Kot Vim, they are writing, masculine, or Atem Kot Vim, you, group of men, are writing, or Anachnu Kot Vim, we, group of men, are writing. Okay, masculine plural. Okay, Kot Vim. Was looking at Kotvin, not knowing what Kotvin is, but I know the alphabet, mm -hmm. and I will be reading like that in order to get to the root. Yes. Since I know to pull out the whole line and the yod and the mean, right. There is nothing to let me know what to pull out if I didn't know that. Only knowing the patterns will give you a hint. Mm. Once you know the conjugation patterns. You'll start, you'll start seeing this. Um, and I don't even know them all, but I know enough of them that when I see something, and even if I don't know exactly what pattern it's following, I can usually pick out the root. Now, there are some patterns in which one of these radical letters disappears. And those are a little confusing because you don't know which letter to sub back in and where it goes in sometimes. But for the most part, once you know some of these patterns, you can look at a word like this and you can say, okay, I know this em ending is the masculine plural, okay, and I know this vav here is part of a conjugation. So then you're left with three letters that indicate your root. So yeah, a lot of times you can trace trace words back that way. But the greatest utility though is actually building them up to what you want them to be. Of course, though, when you're interpreting scripture, you've got to go back to the root to figure out what the word means. Okay. Now, so the masculine plural is kot vim. You can probably already predict then what the feminine plural is going to be. Kot vote, indeed. And we add ot. Okay. So we would say hain, 
they feminine, quote, vote, are writing. Or a ten, you, group of women, are writing. Or a nachnu, if we were a group of women, quote, vote, are writing. Okay? So, kotev, kotevet, kotvim, Quote, vote. All right? And as I mentioned before, you can take another route and do the exact same thing with it, follow the exact same pattern, and arrive at the exact same sense. So, let's take a, a route. Um, about iron bait dalit. Okay? This root means to serve. And in fact, uh, one of the words on our vocabulary this week comes from that root. It's a noun, but eved, okay, eved means a servant. So that makes some sense. The word for servant comes from the root to serve. Okay. Mm -hmm. As a verb, we can plug it in to this active participle conjugation, which roughly equates to the present tense, to come up with is serving. Okay. So for the masculine singular, lovade. Yes, indeed, like Ovadia, the prophet, Obadiah. Yes, that's what his name means, servant of Yah. Yes, so Oved, feminine, okay, is serving. Okay, that's how that, that's how this active participle works, is just make it in this is, doing, whatever the root is, form. Okay. Oved. Okay, if a woman is serving, ovedet. If men are serving, ovedim. Mm -hmm. And if women are serving, ovedot. Okay? Oved, ovedit, ovdim, ovdot. Okay, so that is the active participle, which you can use as the present tense. Question. Yes. Before you erase that, is uh, ovedot the same as serve when you write it? Uh, yes, you will see this translated as labor or work sometimes, in addition to serve. Um, so, eved. Uh, can also mean a laborer, not necessarily a servant, you know, that, you, that lives with you per se, but someone who labors for you. Uh, it can also mean slave. Avoda means uh, service or labor. Okay, and so the priests do avoda, they do service, but, and some of what the priests do is very physical, like slaughtering animals and butchering and uh, you know, setting up the tent and that kind of thing, but some of their service isn't physical stuff. It's things like reading the Torah to the people, and you know, some of it's not necessarily. Uh, I mean, it's hands-on in that they're involved, but it's not uh, manual labor per se. So, um, so this ha kind of has both connotations. It could be actual physical labor, or just the idea that you are functioning as a servant. But yes, work is another possibility. There's another word for work, though, too. So there's little nuances to some of the words. OK? So yes, that's the active participle. And just to give, a, um, just to give one fun little sentence. OK, so again, returning to our subject, Adam. If Adam were writing Hebrew, we could say Adam 
Kotev. Yes, and actually, what we would write is Be'ivrit. Adam is writing in Hebrew. Okay, so if you write this down and you substitute your name right here, or a transliteration of your name here, then you're doing exactly what you're writing. And in fact, you're writing a correct Hebrew sentence as you're doing it. So, Adam Kotev Ba'ivrit. So, Dov is Dalet? Right. Yes, Ivrit is uh, the Hebrew language. I think that's on the on the advanced vocabulary list for this week. Um, so yes, and this bait is is the preposition, uh, the prepositional prefix, which means in or with. Okay, so you're writing with Hebrew or in Hebrew. Yes. And actually, you'll probably. You'll probably see it written defectively more than in the full form, so without the Vav more than with the Vav, but I think either way would be correct. Uh, yes, you could say Ani Kotev, uh, well, Be Ivrit. Um, I have to put the Be in there. Yes, you do need to put the bait there. Um, because you're not, you're not writing the Hebrew language. You're writing in the Hebrew language. So, so yes, that is a difference. Now, for you, you would say Ani Kotevet. Since you, since you are feminine. Okay, but I would say Ani Kotev. So yes, women, you would write Kotevet because you are feminine and singular. Okay. Gotcha. Yes, so additionally, Rachel Kotevet, but you've read. Okay, or Sarah Kotevet, but you've read. Uh, and one other thing I'll point out, um, because I gave a verb before, and I actually gave you the active participle form of that verb. Okay, you might be wondering why it doesn't follow this pattern. The verb I gave you before was ba, and I said that ba means is coming. Okay, now you'll notice that ba looks absolutely nothing like kotev and yet it is still the active participle. All right, and I'm not gonna go through the entire thing with this, but the reason that is, and we'll find this as we move along in conjugation, is the root of ba is a three-letter root. Okay, it's a two-letter word, but it comes from a three-letter root, which is bait, vav, aleph. And so, just an overview, anytime we've got a root, in which the second radical is a vav, it's going to follow different conjugation patterns than roots where the second radical is not a vav. Okay, and so in this case, in the case of ba, in the masculine singular, that vav drops, and we've got a comets vowel. Okay, so that follows a different pattern where, you know, in, in our first uh, our first section there, it looks like this. The vav's the second radical, it's totally gone, so we've got a box with a one, a comets vowel, and then our three. Okay. So I'm not gonna go through the entire thing of that, but I just want, want you to know that that ba word that we had before is in fact the active participle, okay, but it's following a special rule for roots that have a vav as their second radical. Yes, as we go along, we will cover those instances. Um, I'm not gonna go into 
extensive detail on that because that would take every single week we've got, but I'm going to give charts that have the whole thing on there. And if you understand the concept, you can follow the charts. So, but anyway, just to let you know, you know, because someone might think of that, hey, that we, I remember that Bob being a verb, and, but that is, it is in fact the active participle, it's just following a pattern that applies to the Bob being the second radical. Okay? Now, when you say you want to give charts, is that when you bring charts to class as handouts? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes, and they will be online as well. Hopefully, actually, I'm hoping I can find some good charts online somewhere so I don't have to type them all up because they're uh, quite involved. But some, some are easier to follow than others, and I kind of happen to like the method I have of doing it. So, and I haven't seen that duplicated in many books. So, not to say that the, the way the books do it is wrong at all. I just, I learn it better from the way I do it. Okay, so that is the active participle. Okay, which again corresponds approximately to the present tense. All right. So the second subject that I wish to cover today is called the construct state. And as with most things in language, this is a fancy way of saying adding the word of. Okay? So, when we have two words that are connected by the word of, and again the word of is invisible in Hebrew, the first word of that phrase is said to be in the construct state. So, for example, um, if we were to have the phrase the uh, king of Israel, okay, king is melech, right? Of is invisible in Hebrew. We have no word for of. So, if we wish to say king of Israel. We simply say Melech Yisrael. Now, when we do that, we're now forming a compound phrase. Okay, a phrase composed of two words. And this first word is said to be in the construct state. Now, why is that important? Well, it's important because sometimes things happen to the word that's in the construct state. Okay? Now, in the phrase, king of Israel, that doesn't happen. There's no, no transformation that occurs with this. Sometimes in texts, uh, you'll see uh, phrases that are connected like this have a have sort of this dash-looking mark showing you the words are connected to each other. Sometimes not. Um, anyway, if you do see that dash, that's what it means. It's, it's just connecting words that are part of a, a compound phrase. Um, However, a lot of times, or sometimes I should say, a word that's in the construct state will undergo some changes. And um, these changes are actually helpful because they indicate that it's in the construct state. So if you're not sure where to put an of in a sentence, these vowel changes are a giveaway that it needs to go right after that word. Okay, now, melech Yisrael, no change, no problem. But there are a couple words, there are a number of words that, that undergo these changes, but there are two that I, that I really want to focus in on. And the first one is bayit, which means house. Okay. When bayit is put in the construct state, these vowels combine, basically, and the new form is bait. So the patach, chirik disappear and are replaced with a tsera. Still means house, it's still the same word, but it, now it's in the construct state. So anytime you have a phrase, house of, insert word here, it'll be called bait, whatever you have. Okay? So uh, uh, Bethel, okay, the place that Jacob named, means house of God. It's not Bayat El, but it is Beit El. Okay. Just like 
Right, because it's, the bait is in the construct state. It's the first part of the phrase x of y. Okay, so it undergoes this vowel change. That's why, you know, when I introduce the word byte, everybody says, don't you mean bait? And I say, no, I mean by it. <laughs> because when it's not in the construct state, if you're just speaking of a house, you say by it. But if it's the house of something, it's bait. And most of the time in the scriptures, it doesn't just speak of a house. It's house of prayer, house of God, Beit Lechem, house of bread, or Bethlehem. Okay, most of the time you see the word house, uh, house of Israel, house of Judah, these sorts of things. Um, it's in the construct state, so it's pronounced Beit. Okay. So Beit Lechem in the house of Bethlehem in scripture? Beit Lechem means house of bread, and that's transliterated into English as Bethlehem. Um, <laughs> but uh, but when you see Beit Lechem, it doesn't just mean, you know, the phrase takes on a definition of its own. It doesn't just mean a house with bread in it. It's referring to the city of Bethlehem. Okay. So similarly with Beit El, you know, it's referring to the spot. It's referring to the house of God or the, the city that's named house of God. Okay. So by it to Beit is one. Um, and the other one that I want to point out is this is not a vowel, well it is a vowel change, but it's, uh, it's always a vowel contraction. It always goes from a longer vowel to a shorter vowel. So in the case of Bane, which means son, when this is put in the construct state, the tsera shortens to form a segel. Okay, it goes from a, which is a long vowel, to e, which is a short vowel. So Bane becomes Ben. And again, this is one that every time I introduce Bane, they say, well, can you say Ben? I say, well, yes, but in the construct state. Okay, just a son on his own is Bane. But if we wish to say, um, well, suppose the phrase uh, in Ezekiel, son of man. Okay, it's repeated in Ezekiel time and time again. And again, it's repeated in the New Testament. Okay, that phrase is Ben Adam. It's not son of man. It's in fact, son of mankind. Son of Adam. Yes, or son of Adam, even. Ben-ish. Right, Ben. Yeah, son of a man would be Ben Ish, but that's kind of you're not saying much by saying you're the son of a man. <laughs> you know, everybody's the son of a man except for Adam. Um, so, uh, but yes, the phrase Ben uh, Ben Adam. It's not Bane Adam because Bane is in the construct state. Since we've got this connection of. Bane goes in the construct state, and the vowel shortens to a segel. Uh, if you were to say son of God, ben Elohim would be the same thing. Instead of bane Elohim, ben Elohim. Okay? Good thing they shorten that. I'd run out of breath saying bane. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's... <clears throat> yeah, it shortens probably because some of the emphasis falls on the second word. Yeah, is it actually shorter? The vowel is, it's, it's, it changes from a long vowel to a short vowel. A is a long vowel and E is a short vowel. And so I, Y changes to A. Okay. So, right. So, so anyway, all that to say the vowels will change and they'll always go to a more contracted form than they were in before. Okay. So I do need to wrap up, but are there any questions before I do? Actually, there's one more subject. I'll just cover that first part of next week on the construct state. Mm. Okay. So. You said it shortens, though. By it. Right. That's shorter in length. It, it went from two vowels to one. Okay. So it combined the two vowels. Mm. So yes, it does. It is a contraction, even though a in bait is a long vowel, strictly speaking. <laughs> it went from two short vowels short to one long vowel, before. right? But yes, it 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 just um, it's almost like slurring the word. Yeah. So. So okay. Well, uh, we'll catch you all next week for Advanced Hebrew Week Two. Shalom. Mm-hmm.